I'm really delighted to be here. It's it's so um, I'm so honored, really, to be able to have a conversation with a group that has been working and growing for for such a long time. Um, the work of Future Church to me is is fascinating um, from its inception with uh, uh, with Chris Shank years ago. I remember that Chris Chris had me out uh, to uh, uh, Cleveland uh, to speak, and uh, I think it was a Mary Magdalene event, and and there were pickets outside, uh, women picketing. They had rosary beads around their necks. They had signs. I'm not quite sure. I wasn't quite sure what they were complaining about, and so <clears throat> Christy, Chris was inside, and I went out to the picketers, and I said, "What's going on? Why are you picketing?" They said, "Phyllis Sagano is going to speak here today." I said, "You're joking," and and they they gave me the lowdown, and uh, uh, and I went inside and I spoke. You know, um, it's. Uh, it's it's a privilege to uh, publish works and not have your picture on the books. I guess that's the thing. But but those days are gone, and uh, I'm just back from speaking in Ireland at Trinity College Dublin, where there's an intense interest, uh, really, in women in the church. But today we're going to talk about the book that just came out, um, Just Tur Church: Catholic Social Teaching, Synodality, and Women. Um, you know my own research. My research is uh, focuses on the central question: um, How can women be part of the church in a just manner? That's the central question. When we consider the situations of women inside and outside of the church around the world, what are the implications of the ways women are included and not included in church and in the larger society? These are the questions in this book. Um, what can we do to ensure that women are treated justly? And, 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 and it's not a political question. I have to underscore that. It's not a political uh, consideration. I think the Pope really with the Synod is asking us to consider three questions. Um, what has the church done? What is the church doing? And what can the church do for Christ? That's the bottom line for Christ and the people of God. That's who all of this discussion is about. And of course, I ask, what about women? Um, so today I have three points for your consideration. Um, Catholic social teaching, what the church has done. And I'll, I'll just briefly go over kind of what's in the church, because I know you want uh, what's going on in, in the history of Catholic social teaching, because I know you want to get to questions um, so what has the church done? Uh, the question of synodality, what is the church doing? And, and then women, what can the church do? So Catholic social teaching, what has the church done? You know, the root of Catholic social teaching is justice. And I believe justice, now acting justly, leads to correct moral action. Justice has a lot of attributes, okay? Equality, fairness, access, participation. Philosophers have been writing about justice for centuries. The church has said a lot about it as well. So to establish the conversation, let's look at how the church, first of all, has contributed, both as it criticizes the world and as its own criticism can be applied internally to itself. And that's the important part here. Uh, the church is very good about uh, criticizing the world. Let's, let's turn it inward. So what, what is generally termed Catholic social teaching has its roots at least in the modern era, in Pope Leo XIII's encyclical Rerum Novarum, New Things. Uh, that appeared in 1891. Now, in 1891, the Victorian age was about to end. Slavery had been abolished in much of the West. The Industrial Revolution was creating great opportunities for profit. Cities were becoming more crowded. Much of the developing world in South and Southeast Asia and in Africa was still under colonial rule. And then, then Pope Leo appears as a Christian economist with his encyclical on rights and duties of capital and labor. That's the subtitle of Rerum Novarum. His complaint was the rich are exploiting the poor to the point of what he calls, quote, 
prevailing moral degeneracy. Listen, listen to what Leo wrote. The elements of the conflict now raging are unmistakable. In the vast expansion of industrial pursuits and the marvelous discoveries of science and the changed relations between masters and workmen in the enormous fortunes of some few individuals and the utter poverty of the masses, the increased self-reliance and closer mutual combination of the working classes and also finally in the prevailing moral degeneracy. That sound familiar? That was 1891. Now, three newer papal encyclicals, these by Pope Francis, extend the conversation. Uh, he has Lumen Fidei in 2013, Laudato Si' in 2015, and Fratelli Tutti in 2020. This first encyclical of Francis, Lumen Fidei, The Light of Faith, was, was actually in the works well before Francis appeared uh, on the balcony there in St. Peter's, it, but it helped set the tone for his papacy. It's about justice. It's about justice and governance, about how Christian faith lights a path toward that justice in the journey of life. It is not, incidentally, the first paper. It is not, incidentally, the first papal encyclical ever written by two popes. It was begun by, uh, by Benedict and then completed by Francis. The next encyclical that we have from Francis, though, Laudato Si, praise be to you, is holy from the mind and heart of this former chemist. He's a Jesuit Pope, yes. I mentioned France's scientific training for a very real reason. He was roundly criticized by some people for his foray into scientific matters. Yet what he wrote now nearly eight years ago is easier to understand as our planet moves closer to atmospheric doomsday. Francis goes beyond the obvious in Laudato Si. In the second encyclical letter, he connects the dots, if you will, among consumerism, irresponsible development, environmental degradation, and global warming. And then he has Fratelli Tutti with the subtitle on fraternity and social friendship. Yes, I understand St. Francis spoke to, quote, all brothers and sisters. Yes, I know in Italian, the phrase means everybody, but the tin ears of the papal briefers are on display here. And I wonder if it might help if the Vatican hired a few women uh, to help and write review his documents. Because even so, even so though, this document, this encyclical is meant to explain that we're all in this together, especially in the face of common emergencies such as the COVID-19 pandemic. Now, the Holy Father writes wonderful documents. He really is genuinely a good man. Sometimes he scratches things the wrong way, but let's go to synodality. The ever ancient, ever new root of the church. Synodality, what is the church doing? Well, we have the Synod on Synodality, the 16th Ordinary Assembly of the Synod of Bishops, which promises discernment about how the church, that's communion, how the church, that is the whole church participation, can move along in mission <clears throat> in the light of the spirit. Now, you'll remember the process began in October of 2021. Every bishop was to have opened a diocesan synodal process resulting in a synthesis for the National Episcopal Conferences, which in turn presented to uh, their papers to Rome last summer. And then a large uh, writing team gathered in Rome to prepare the document for the continental phrase, which in turn went back to the um, for consideration to uh, national groupings, which then would participate in the writing of a continental response to be forwarded to Rome for a second go around. Now that's that's where we are now. The continental assemblies have met. Uh, the United States met only by Zoom. The other six met in person. And the writing teams prepared responses, which had to be done by the end of March. They actually finished coming out, I would say, the third week of April. At some point, possibly possibly now at the end of this month, uh, the names of the synod uh, participants and the instrumentum laboris will be published. Uh, the, writing, the writing happened uh, the teen week of, of April. 
Now, various voices may still present their concerns and desires, but the course of the synod will have been set with the instrumentum laboris. And then the first full synod meeting is in Rome this coming October, I think October 4th it opens. And then a second uh, meeting will be held in October of 2024. Um, <clears throat> Russ mentioned at the top, the, the interest in the expansion of the number of voting members. Let me explain how that works. There are 300 seats in the room, that's it. They can't put in more seats, they can't have more headphones, they, they can't have more breakout rooms for, for language groups. Typically in the past, 180 members have been bishops of various stripes, shall we say. Uh, people coming from dicasteries nominated from their Episcopal conferences. So you have, assume you have 180 seats for bishops. You also had uh, 10 religious men voting. And there were, as auditors, 10 religious women. The change in the document is that there will be five men and five women religious as voting members. So now you're up to 190. Now you have 70 others. Now where are you gonna find them? Uh, what he has said is that each of the seven continental uh, groupings, continental assemblies, can nominate 20 people. Those 20 people must be 50% uh, male, 50% female, and uh, there must be a number of younger people in that group. So now you have 140 nominees, of which the Holy See will choose 70. <clears throat> Does that mean 70 women? Not necessarily. It could mean 85 women. <laughs> it could be 85 men. It could be um, 13 from the North American Assembly and 27 from Europe. Uh, we just know that there will be 140 names in the pool and in that nomination pool, it has to be 50-50, <clears throat> which is interesting because uh, as, as Russ mentioned at the top in 2016, I was nominated to a commission that for the first time in the history of the church had 50% uh, male and 50% female uh, participation um, or nomination. So things are moving in that direction. But now we still have 40 extra chairs left in the room. And who, who is that? That's the experts. These people do not have uh, votes, but they are there to for theological and, and substantive questions, which may be raised in any of the language groups. They're chosen by the synod team and they are uh, invited to come and sit in as experts. A lot of people, I know people who've said they can't do it. They just don't have the time to do it. The question has been raised, uh, she said in the passive voice, uh, of, of what happens to the point of the auditors. The auditors have a very important role and they're just not there. So their chairs have been taken over by uh, voting members of the general, the general public, shall we say. Uh, it's not just lay people. It's, uh, it's priests, deacons, <clears throat> male and female religious, uh, uh, including priest religious and lay religious, and, uh, and then secular men and women, uh, including older and younger people. So we don't know what it will be. <clears throat> and uh, it's turning in, as someone said to me the other night at a reception, it's turning very much into being the Pope's Synod. Uh, he's, he's very strong on having a participation in this. Uh, and I would just trust the Holy Spirit in it. I, I, I don't think it's a time for politicking. I, I don't know anyone who really wants to give up uh, three weeks and sit basically and look at, if you ever looked at line, line documents, you know, if you ever see a, a legal document where they have the, uh, the, 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 um, uh, the lines numbered, you know, and so you, uh, many times in these meetings, you're sitting there saying, well, line 32 on page 48, I need to talk about this. And, and you go through line by line by line. Um, it's almost as bad as death by PowerPoint. In any event, the, the, um, the, that will be the makeup of the crowd. Uh, it is assumed, although who knows, that'll be the same crowd the next year. Uh, you, you just don't know. Um, but any event, it's important here 
in the middle of all this to recall how the International Theological Commission presented the process of synodal discernment. Um, what they said is, quote, discernment must be carried out in a space of prayer, meditation, reflection, and study, which we need to hear the voice of the Spirit by means of sincere, serene, and objective dialogue with our brothers and sisters, by paying attention to the real experiences and challenges of every community and every situation, in the exchange of gifts and in the convergence of all the energies in view of building up the body of Christ and proclaiming the gospel, in the melting pot of feelings and thoughts that enable us to understand the Lord's will by searching to be set free by the gospel from any obstacle that might weaken our openness to the spirit. <clears throat> and I'm just, as I'm reading here, I'm noticing setting free, you know, freedom, freedom from and freedom to and freedom for are great uh, uh, Ignatian terms in any event. It's clear from the initial national reports that both women and men of the church understand that women and to a large extent, all lay persons are considered quote, outsiders by the hierarchy. So you have this tension here where the Holy Father is trying to bring the peripheries to the, to the inside. All too often as quote, outsiders, lay persons are dismissed as not understanding the question, not having appropriate education, having political agendas, the fear the fear, in fact, is the fact that lay persons have no real place in governance and ministry. So what outsider, uh, the fear is the fact, lay persons have no real place in governance and ministry. So what outsider voices will be heard? And in fact, do the votes matter? <clears throat> because if you think back towards the Australian uh, Plenary Council, there was the uh, deliberative and then the, the final vote. And it took a while for the Australians to, um, the Australian Plenary Council to agree uh, that it was okay to talk about women deacons. Um, the first, uh, first draft of paragraph four of, of, of the document uh, just absolutely was passed by the General Assembly, but then not passed by the bishops. And that was basically the problem. And so the central question remains, what is synodality? You see, we know the Synod promises discernment about communion, participation, and mission. It promises discernment about these in the light of the Spirit. But the Synod really seems bereft still of some voices. You see, depending on the parish, the diocese, or the continent, the International Theological Commission's elegant concept of synodal discernment is by necessity um, limited to a select few. <clears throat> Think about it. Have you had the opportunity for discernment on church matters, quote, in a space of prayer, meditation, reflection, and study? Maybe you have. But really, have you been able to engage in sincere, serene, and objective dialogue with your brothers and sisters? Maybe yes, in your parish or diocese. But there are many people who've been cut out of the, of the conversation for any number of reasons, to name a few. One. Some places only had, quote, electronic synods, Zoom meetings, and online questionnaires. Some places uh, had only invitation-only in-person meetings. I can attest to that. Some places held meetings at inconvenient times or places, and the list goes on. Yes, um, there was a facility for, quote, outsiders to participate in programs run by lay Catholic groups, such as Future Church, and religious institutes and orders. And these produced results, which went either to the national Episcopal conferences for synth went to either to their national um, <clears throat> Episcopal conferences for synthesis into national reports or directly to Rome. Even so, or sometimes both. The bottom line is a lot of people were cut out, and a lot of them were women. Now I've had conversations with Senate officials, and I kind of agree on this point. Uh, two things. One. Uh, when you do a statistical survey, 4% is, is an appropriate number of people to, to survey. And I realize this is not a survey. But the other point is, and I take this sincerely, that even when it doesn't work, it works. Because when it doesn't work, there's so much noise about it not working, it's working. Um, in the prevalent 
recommendations of the English speaking world. And in many, if not most of other countries gathered in the Continental Synod meeting so far, the place of status and status of women in the church is uppermost. Um, and there's public electronic analysis of the numbers of, of mentions um, uh, in, the, in the national reports. There were 112 national reports of 114 possible national reports. And the seven continental responses are the same. The questions of women are uppermost. <clears throat> now, the cultures uh, around the world clearly are different and distinct, and the place of women differs within them. So the response is different in oftentimes in tone. But it's no secret, and this is well known, and, and it is reflected in every report. It's no secret that the centers of power are linked to ordination. Uh, but on the other hand, power, at least by my estimate, is not of particular interest to women. Women are interested in being taken seriously. And women are interested in being ministered to by other women. I'll say that again. Women are interested in being taken seriously. And women are interested in being ministered to by other women. So the third part of the book is about women. What can the church do? You see, the question on everybody's mind about women in the church and about so many other points is what can happen? We know what the church cannot do. It cannot change revelation. We can argue all we want about changing doctrine or developing it. It's a fact that doctrine develops. We know the church can change practice. That's where the argument about women, women rests. It has nothing and everything to do with the doctrine and with revelation. You see, are the, the question is, are the restrictions against ordaining women rooted in revelation? Some people have written this, although not very convincingly. Most people tend to agree with St. Paul. Uh, we're all one in Christ Jesus. You can look it up. That is, we are all equally human. So, so then are the restrictions against ordaining women rooted in doctrine? Well, it depends on what doctrine you're citing and what ordination. For the sake of our discussion here, and really for the sake of my research, let us agree with Avery Cardinal Dulles that the only accurate discussion about women priests right now is about the level of the teaching of Ordinatio Sacerdotalis. That's the 1994 Apostolic Letter of John Paul II, which was affirmed one year later by the Congregation for the Doctrine of the Faith. At that time, uh, then Cardinal Ratzinger wrote that the teaching that the church does not have the authority to ordain women as priests, quote, requires definitive assent <clears throat> as belonging to the deposit of faith. But there is not now, and there never has been any doctrinal determination regarding the ordination of women as deacons. For example, in the synod synthesis for the, doc, uh, the Archdiocese of Los Angeles, <clears throat> quote, women are limited to certain leadership roles, their spiritual gifts not being fully recognized and utilized. Many voices advocate for offering greater opportunities for women to serve in leadership and some raise the possibility of women deacons. Yeah, everybody's been saying that. So before we get on to restoring the tradition of women ordained to the diaconate, in the Catholic churches, <clears throat> we can remind ourselves what Pope Francis has done so far to include more women in positions of the senior staff in the Roman Curia. You know, perhaps you'll recall that when he was elected Pope, Francis sat for a long and wide ranging interview with the Italian editor of uh, La Tivita Cattolica. In it, a small section on women, he said it was important for the church to have what he termed a more incisive female presence. He had to give more space, più spazio. Over the years, he's repeated that phrase. And over the years, he's added women, mostly women religious, to important staff positions in the Vatican. But, but management is not ministry. Francis underscored that point not long ago when he referred to a theory by Hans Urs von Balthasar, not by name, uh, you know the story, the Marian principle, and the Petrine principle uh, saying that the Petrine theory uh, was about ministry and it meant women could not be ordained. And he said um, that the Marian principle was that the church is feminine. 
And he said there's another way to include women in the church to increase women in administrative positions. Um, and he did say women are better managers than than all uh, than men. <clears throat> Not a few people saw these comments as mansplaining. Some people argue women can't be ordained as deacons because women cannot act or be in persona Christi servi, in the person of Christ the servant. That invokes a naive physicalism, uh, which reduces the risen Christ to the human male Jesus. You know, and I think that we have to recall that the deacon, the earlier notion of the deacon was that the deacon was and ministered in nomine ecclesia in the name of the church. So if the church is female hmm, and the deacon ministers in the name of the church, maybe by this argument, only women should be deacons. Hmm. You know, it, that's, that's kind of only a weak pushback to the idea that women cannot be ordained to ministry. There are longer and stronger arguments all based in theological, anthropological evaluation of the history of ordained women in our Catholic churches that demonstrate it's entirely possible for women to be readmitted to the single order of deacon. History is clear. Women were ordained using identical or nearly identical liturgies by bishops who named them deacons. There are manuscripts of these liturgical texts in the Vatican Library in the Pope's backyard. I have sat on a very rainy day looking at them. And there are several libraries in Europe and elsewhere that hold these manuscripts and liturgies, liturgy manuscripts. Scholars have studied the manuscripts and, and found they meet the requirements for the sacramental ordination as determined by the Council of Trent. So in conclusion, I'm convinced the church is done, the church can do again. You know, what have we done? What are we doing? And what can we do for Christ? That, you see, is what we need to concentrate on. We know the trajectory of Catholic social teaching. That presents communion. What are we doing? We know the synod with its bumps and turns, its facts and foibles, the genuine effort to ask the people of God how the gospel can be better shared with the world. That invites participation. So what can we do? There are so many ills in the world. The planet and its people suffer unimaginable wounds. We need, as we journey together in the light of Catholic social teaching, to help the church and the world understand that women are made in the image and likeness of God, that women can indeed image Christ. That is part, and I think a large part, of the mission, of your mission, of my mission, of our mission, of the mission of the church, to do that to teach the church and the world that women are worthy of respect, that women are capable of both management and ministry, I think is what we can do for Christ. So they told me 30 minutes. I'll take questions. Thank you, Phyllis. Um, so what we'll do is we're going to open it up here. So if you would like to ask a question or make a comment, please keep it short and to the point so we can get as many as <laughs> as possible. So you can use that little uh, hold your hand up sign, uh, or if you can't find it, physically hold your hand up and we'll call on you. Um, Phyllis, you know that at the Amazon Synod that it was recommended by a majority that they open ordination to men and talk about women deacons. I mean, some wanted women deacons already. Um, but Pope Francis did not follow his own, <laughs> you know, plan in in that you know, uh, communio episcopalis that said, you know, we'll make if if there's a majority, we're going to make it ordinary magisterium. What is it going to take for him to open himself up to the idea that women could be ordained deacons? Well, let's back up a little bit. Nine of 12 language groups at the Amazon Synod asked for women in the diaconate. It was not that specific in paragraph 103, I think, uh, in terms of asking for women deacons. I think he the request was to send it back to committee. Uh, what he did, they did request and they did receive women installed as lectors and as acolytes. And the question about women as lectors actually came up in a 2008 synod. So, you know, the church doesn't move very quickly. Um, I actually just reviewed or just received the 
Portuguese translation of a uh, an article I published in Ireland uh, about Great Amazonia and specifically the points that you are raising. Um, and and what I what I discovered in in thinking about that that uh, article is that he emphasized Canon 517, paragraph two, which are parish life coordinators. And <clears throat> what I, I describe in this article, which is on my website, you can take it down. Um, I think he's saying first, let's, if Sister, if Sister Mary Wonderful is running a parish in, in South America, well, let's, what he did say was the bishop really should make it official, and he intimated that they should have term limits and uh, and proper salaries. But if sister doesn't have a vocation to the diaconate, uh, you know, uh, why why would you um, change? He I I always say he's do, instead of the church being like this, he's trying to make it like this. So. Mm-hmm. When you have the the parish life coordinator, and, I, and I've seen this in in holy um, holy something, holy name parish, holy spirit parish, in in uh, South Pasadena, California, there was a lay woman in charge. She had priests on staff, she had deacons on staff, she had others on staff, uh, and she was managing a parish. I think the 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 second part of your question <clears throat> about married priests, the same the same act, uh, dynamic. Uh, uh, is in is in play. If if sister is running the parish, and the married deacon in the parish now becomes a priest, I think our automatic uh, feeling uh, of of Catholics now is well, father's here, he's in charge, and I uh, they're, they're separate but related questions. I think if you see uh, married priests, and he has said this actually, if if some, they want married priests, they have to ask for it. And I think the new uh, Episcopal um, grouping in the Amazon Synod, there are nine uh, countries and territories and then one, <clears throat> one president. So there are 10 bishops who are representing the Amazon. It, it was the president was Cardinal Humus, the Holy Father's really good friend uh, who died. And now another bishop from Brazil is the president. I think they will simply uh, present their need uh, for ordaining uh, married men. Now, this is not a new question. In the 70s in Australia, they were asking to ordain uh, Wary Prabhati. But um, but I think that uh, in terms of making things magisterial, uh, what he said about Quarried Amazonia, which he signed, by the way, from St. John Lateran as the, as the Bishop of Rome, um, he said these two must be read in tandem. And they must be read in tandem. And I think that in line with the way the Synod has de- is developing and the way he talks about it and the way it is talked about, uh, he's, he's almost asking the church to embrace its subsidiarity uh, and to say what it needs. And so <clears throat> uh, some... I I do think, in in terms of uh, directly to your question on the married priests, I do think if this grouping in the Amazon asks for married priests, they will get it. Uh, But I think that's all going to be part of the the synodal discussion here. Um, And in terms of women deacons, uh, it will roll out the same as as men deacons did. Uh, The the church at some point, it's a simple motu proprio, there's no doctrine against it. We'll say if you want, if a national assembly wants women deacons, you just have to ask for it, and uh, uh, and it'll be that. And and people in fifty years will wonder what all the discussion was about. Yeah, <laughs> Barb, you have a question. Go ahead. Yeah, hi, uh, Phyllis. I just have an observation. You know, there's been a lot of talk within the synodal documents. We're hearing about the need for formation of the laity, and they're really craving it for many ways. But here in L.A. and the neighboring diocese of Orange, we're seeing a very much of an infusion of these programs like Endow, uh, also given uh, the FOCUS program, which is moving off of college campuses into parishes that very much relegate women to a second-class status in the church, and it's really perpetuating 
uh, the paradigm we're living in now. And I just wondered if you can speak to that and how we might address that issue when we see these types of formation programs offered at the exclusion of really being an inclusive and synodal church. Yeah, Barb, I, I, you know, I don't know. I know something about focus, and it is kind of scary. Um, <clears throat> I, I just don't know uh, about those. And, and what does formation mean? Most of my conversations, at least in Rome, about formation has been formation of clerics so that they understand and are assisted in becoming adult human beings who can uh, uh, navigate their priestly ministry um, uh, able to have uh, adult adult uh, relationships with with people uh, and not be so um, uh, feel that they are so imbued with power that they are above the so-called the, the laity. Um, I, I I can't speak directly to what's going on in Los Angeles because I just don't know about it. And uh, uh, although focus is uh, interestingly enough, focus I think is at secular college campuses, not at Catholic college campuses, which for the most part are hanging on to uh, uh, a more, you might say, synodal presentation of the church. I'm sorry if I, I can't answer more. Thanks, Barb. Other questions? I can keep talking. What did you think of John Allen's article today that um, bringing lady on would be stacking the deck. Did you read that? No. Okay. Okay. <laughs> no, and I wouldn't agree with that. That what yeah. do you mean stacking the deck? I, you know, uh, yeah. it it's. Uh, well, he said it out. He said what he meant was that it would water down the influence of uh, conservative bishops. So. Yeah, you don't know. I mean, how do you not know that yeah. uh, certain. Um, <clears throat> Certain uh, continental groupings will not give twenty conservative names. I, I, I think it's I think it's incorrect to use political terms uh, when you're talking about church. You know, uh, this this is not uh, this is not the synod. The synodal process and the synod are not uh, popularity contests, and nor are they political surveys. Um, it's really a question of, of listening for the spirit and how can we best preach the gospel? I happen to think, and I have happened to have thought for a long time, that it would be helpful to have women's voices preaching the gospel. Um, I know you're involved in the project called Catholic Women Preach, you mm -hmm. know, and, uh, <clears throat> uh, but you need to speak so you can be heard. And so, uh, I, I, I just don't, you know, I, I disagree uh, yeah. that you don't know what's going to happen. And, and I think it, it shows a uh, uh, it shows a disregard and a disrespect, really, for the people who are doing the choosing. Yeah, for sure. Um, Mary Garlos asked Phyllis, uh, can Phyllis give us some ideas of what the Synod will actually be voting on in particular? What do you think the issues are that will be taken up? Well, it, it, you can take a look at the document for the continental stage, um, mm -hmm. and and from that in, infer um, that the instrument of laboris, which is really what they'll be voting on, um, the instrument of laboris will be the statement uh, from the synod, and that's what I referred to earlier when you go down line by line. <clears throat> and fight over individual words, but you're also fighting over topics. Now, the other topics that have come up, um, obviously uh, uh, people have uh, are, are concerned about uh, divorced and remarried, uh, divorced about uh, uh, LGBT. Uh, I don't know, abortion, I mean, abortion is, is, is uh, that's, that's, it's kind of a non-starter. Non I mean, what's to discuss? Um, uh, women in ministry is prevalent in the ones that I have looked at. I've looked at all of them. Um, <clears throat> I'm very interested in the one from the Middle East. I'm trying to track down how that happened uh, because we have 23 Eastern Catholic churches. And uh, one sentence I saw was that the Maronites were going to do their own thing, uh, which I find fascinating because <clears throat> in 1743, I know you were thinking about this, in 1743, there was the Holy Synod of Mount Lebanon, uh, which 
created canons for the Maronite church, which is an Eastern church, but was never an Orthodox church. It never broke from Rome. And those canons were carried from uh, the Holy Synod in Mount Lebanon to Rome by Joseph Asimani, who presented them to the Pope, who approved them in Forma Specifica, who cares well. One of the canons says, yeah, Bishop, you can ordain women as deacons. And another canon says, by the way, this is what they do. Um, these are Catholic canons that have never been abrogated. Um, that, uh, and it's like yesterday in the church that, that we have these canons, uh, but they're Maronite canons. So it's the Eastern Catholic Church. So I, I think really the ones to watch are the Eastern churches who have a um, not so much a deeper uh, history but a better recollection of women uh, women as deacons and a better understanding of the distinction between the diaconate and the priesthood. The, the, the Western pushback to women deacons is, oh, well then, you know, they wanna be priests. And if you're a deacon, you can be a priest. Well, um, <clears throat> the, uh, the Eastern understanding is much clearer that the diaconate is not part of the priesthood. Uh, today is the feast of St. Athanasius who was a deacon for, I don't know, three or five years, and then became a bishop. He was never a priest. Uh, and we have 36 uh, yes, popes, 35, 36 popes, who were deacons elected as pope and were never never priested, uh, uh, which is part of the reason the diaconate died out, you know, because the priest got mad. So, <laughs> Thank you, Phyllis. Uh, Carl, you have a question. Uh, yeah, well, uh Quite simple. What recommendations would you have, Phyllis, to bring synodality to be a reality within the local parish, within the local diocese, let alone the champion for the world? Uh, yeah. I think we have to, for me, it has to start. Yeah where I find myself and, and at a loss as to how do I, or what can I do to bring about the change necessary for our church to move forward? Well, that's a very big question, Carl. Um, part of it, I think, belongs to the psychiatrists. Um, and to the formators, because, uh, you know, I, I had this question someplace not too long ago, and I was reminded that we had a new pastor in my parish who announced that he would only meet with the parish council four times a year because all they wanted to do was talking about holes in the parking lot. And, you know, that that attitude, I think, is inculcated in too many fine men uh, who are malformed in seminary. So I think it 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 is uh, it resides in the question of seminary formation, which came up significantly in both the national reports and in the continental reports. But in that's fine for the new ones coming out. But then you have the other ones uh, mm -hmm. who are out there who just ignore. Um, uh, ignore many dioceses uh, just simply ignored the uh, the entire synod synodal process. Yes, and uh, there were fifteen of the one hundred and seventy eight Latin dioceses in the United States. Fifteen did not publish their uh, mm. their reports at all. Thirteen only published uh, summaries. And you'd be interested to know that forty one of the published summaries didn't mention women at all. So last time I looked, women were half the church, but apparently in 41 dioceses, they're not. So uh, I think I, I think it, it becomes a point of energy. Who has the energy to bother with all this? And uh, I, I think it's the um, uh, it, it's 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 a need that we see. And if we don't do it, um, if we don't do it, it, it in many places that it's already on the verge of collapse. 
Um, yeah. And if we don't, if we don't, and I think, you know, I, I, I think about this when I see the, the conjoining of, of parishes, the twinning or whatever they call it, yoking, um, <clears throat> the destruction of community uh, that happens with that. And so uh, I, I think we, we need to think of ourselves as in the Wild West and somehow to figure out ways to maintain community. And if the men want to come and if the priests want to come and talk with us, that's fine. But I, I, I think there that... Uh, 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 you know, it's it's uh, it's a trope to say thoughts and prayers about anything, but I do think we have to think about it, and we do have to pray about it. So, okay. thank Thanks, you, Carl. Rita. You have a question? Oh, thank you. Hey, Phyllis. Um, I wanted to um, firstly say thank you, and I'm very interested in. The fact that you've been to Ireland recently and your you know, work with the Irish spirituality, as well as I don't know if you've investigated any of the tragedies in the Magdalene laundries and how women were treated there. And um, have you in any of your research seen a link between the impulse by a government and a church to really destroy the lives of so many women and girls is that connected to this second class, this view of women as totally second class and, and discardable and, and, and not made in the image of God? I mean, how can they ignore Genesis 1 is my, my basic question. So any thoughts well, on that? I don't know if you have this book, Rita, you must. Yes. Uh, yeah. Icons of Christ. And you know the story that when I uh, was seated at table in the Holy Father's house across from someone who, <clears throat> a member of the Congregation of the Doctrine of the Faith, a staffer. And I said, why can't women be ordained? And he said, because women can't image Christ. And I said, watch me. And then we had, a, you know, I wrote this. Uh, actually, it was came out before the pandemic. But um, in terms of the Magdalene laundries, yes, I actually, uh, on a Fulbright to Waterford, my office was in one of the mother and baby home convents, wow. you know, that the Waterford Institute of Technology had had purchased. And I did talk with a lot of people. I'm not so sure uh, it's it has to do with women being dirty. I think it has to do with sex being dirty. And if you make a baby and you out of wedlock uh, or do any of those dirty things, actually, you know, you are a, a bad person. Um, the stories I heard in Ireland were horrific. Um, the government was complicit, uh, but I, 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 you have to have a, um, I mean, this, the whole society was complicit. I, I don't think it was, it was just the government uh, or, or you know, it, it is the whole society. Um, is it connected uh, to um, the treatment of sororas in the Basque country in, you know, in the 18th mm -hmm. century? Yeah, it is. Mm -hmm. is. Is it connected to other things that I've studied uh, about the maltreatment of, of women, the way the Council of Paris talks about women being dirty and stupid? Yeah, it is. Uh, we, we've inherited a, a, a number of taboos and uh, really incredible uh, visions of women. And, and I, I can tell you, and you may have heard me say this before, I, I blame the church for um, today. FGM. I blame it for dowry burnings. I blame it for rapes and murders, uh, not only in Christian countries, but more so in non-Christian countries, mm -hmm. because until the Pope is standing with a woman standing next to him, proclaiming the gospel, the church really has no right to say that women are made in the image and likeness of God. And in some cases, they don't want to say it anyway. Mm -hmm. uh, and and that's, that's scary. That's very mm -hmm. scary. The last time I looked... Um, uh, I was human. And it's a very a bad twist of Aristotelian uh, philosophy of, of, and, and Thomistic uh, philosophy um, to say that the so-called natural resemblance is only mm -hmm. to a male. Uh, mm -hmm. Because the natural resemblance necessary, any, any, any Christian is able to receive any sacrament unless impeded by, uh, <clears throat> by, by law, 
um, natural or uh, or ecclesiastical law. Um, there is the argument that women cannot be priests by uh, because they're impeded by natural natural law. I don't think that works. Um, I think it's more a tradition, and the church feels it doesn't have the authority. But in terms of of women imaging Christ, it's imaging the nature of the human being, not the maleness of the the accidental you know na- the accident you know accident and substance. Mm-hmm. You know, uh, uh, I mean, if you want to go the, down the route of accidents, well, then, you know, red hair is different from brown hair and left-handed is different from right-handed. Uh, I think that, you know, in, 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 Von Balthasar does do interesting things about the tension, and there are important tensions between male and female, but I don't think that they override uh, the, mm-hmm. under, the underlying argument that we are all humans. So. Okay. Thank you. Thanks, Rita. Kathy, you have a question. Hi. Hey. Uh, Phil, <laughs> uh, are we going to hear anything from this subsequent commission on women deacons, or is is that like washed yeah. up? Well, you know, uh, the the first answer is I don't know, Kathy. the 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 fact of the matter is that the second committee commission, which was named on the eighth of April in 2020, met for one week in September of 2021 and one week in July of 2022, and apparently provided a a, a, a document to the Pope. My own commission met four times uh, for two and a half days, I guess, each um, over a period of two years. We provided a a number of of papers, but I have never seen what the Holy Father received. None of us has seen what the Holy Father received. We, um, I asked uh, Cardinal Adaria three times, twice in, twice in writing and once in person uh, to, uh, uh, tell me exactly what the, and all I got was he got all the papers, but I, I never saw the transmittal letter. Um, I do know that, uh, and I was told by Patricia Murray last May in Rome at the meeting of the International Union of Superiors General that um, they got the history portion. It was only the history portion, I, and but and they were told they could publish it, but they haven't. So, <clears throat> and and they would, and he, he, the Holy Father told them in May of, May of 2019, when he gave them the history portion, I have other papers that you can have, uh, just ask for them and you can do with them what what you want. And he did, they didn't ask and they've done nothing. So the answer is, I don't know. Um, I, we were told that our, our writing was only for the Pope, uh, but he told the UISG they could publish it. The second uh, commission, I don't know if that's an extension of the UISG request. I don't know if they got the copy of it, um, but I, I just don't know where any of it is now. Thank I mean, you. I read, I, read, I read essays written by some of the members of the, the commission, and <clears throat> there's one by a deacon uh, in the Midwest named Serrato who wrote in the National Catholic Register that this is just one one person's, one commissioner's opinion. And he went on and on about how women can't be ordained as deacons. So that I found very hopeful because it sounded like he was complaining about whatever it is went to the Pope. Um, I have to say, I'm, the the response of the UISG has been confounding to me why, why there hasn't been more on that. As, yeah, but anyway, but Patty, you have a question. Yes, I do. And it actually has to do with the last question you talked about was the commission. If they haven't made any pronouncement or recommendation that we haven't had a policy come out of papal, you know, the curie or whatever, that women can't be ordained, then I thought I heard you say earlier very quickly that there's no reason the Pope can't say if some diocese wants to ordain women deacons that they could possibly do that. Well, why doesn't that happen? Wouldn't that be the easy way to ease people into it? Because then some bishops who are against it would not do it. But maybe once it became slowly worldwide accepted, then maybe that would change the the face of the church as a whole. 
Well, there's the ever popular book six of the Code of Canon Law, which says that it's a uh, serious delict to ordain a woman to any grade of order right now. And so <clears throat> while there is no doctrine, there's no doctrine, um, it would take a change or a derogation or at least a change, that means a waiver, or a uh, change in the law. Uh, but there, there's no... There's no, there has never been a doctrinal finding that women can't be ordained, and they can't do it. Uh, years ago, mm -hmm. the most senior woman in the Vatican, uh, Marjorie Keenan, who was at Justice and Peace years ago, I'm telling you, maybe 25 years ago, she told me that uh, they can't say no; they simply don't want to say yes. So that there's no way that 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 can that can happen. Cardinal McElroy has said this publicly. There's no doctrine against it, but again, there is the law, and uh, um, laicity alone, you know, is is just that. It's simple laicity. Um, so one would have to um, have the Holy Father do a motu proprio, saying he's reopening the diaconate to women. It, 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 when it comes out, it will be as the, you know, the first sentence will be as the church has always taught, you know, <laughs> women can be ordained as deacons. Um, uh, but in terms of married priests, that's easier. That's more, more a simple derogation from the law, uh, a waiver um, to be requested because we do have many married priests. So just to go a little further, if you, Pope Francis has said, if you want something, ask for it like ordained men, but that has to come from a conference or not. Am I correct about that? Pretty much so. I mean, yeah. if a bishop, a bishop would go to his conference and, and say, come on, guys, let's do it. And that's not going to happen in the United States with women deacons right now. I'll tell you that right now. They don't even like mm -hmm. the Senate. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> So Maggie, you have a question? I think this is going to have to be the last one. We're already seven after the hour. So. Oh, right. Okay. Thank you. I'll be quick. Um, I'm, I'm calling from London. It's coming up to one in the morning. And um, I am part of Root and Branch, and we're also engaged with um, Spirit and Bounded. So we are putting on an event that will be in Rome later this year. But I, if I could, I just wanted to um, just read a very short part from Mark 7, verse 6. And it's in response to the Pharisees, and I'm sure you know it. But Jesus says, Isaiah was right when he prophesied about you hypocrites, as it is written, these people honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. They worship me in vain. Their teachers are merely human rules. And isn't that what we're seeing here? It's the, the preservation of tradition above all else. I mean, I'm sure we are looking at good old fashioned misogyny. And I think the elephant is in the room because it's as though if there are any games made by women, all of the theology has to be thrown out because I'll try, I, I believe. The, the view of the seed, that male, the male was the generator of life, that formed the basis of so much of the early theological teaching. And you referred to Thomas Aquinas and, you know, whether, you know, there is the full humanness of the female or is the female merely the vessel and so forth. And, of course, was it in 1827 the ovum was found and it was, oh, my gosh, Maybe they really are human as well. I'm not following your question. <laughs> I am. I think is the resistance quite simply misogyny. It's isn't it quite simply that if there is acceptance of the female of the, of woman as equal in all areas, that that would require such a change of theology and loss of power and the status of the clergy that it will be resisted. Isn't it almost the same as well, what we it's, think? Look, it's, it's, of course, it's going to be resisted. And uh, but I can uh, I, I disagree. It's not a change of theology. It's an acceptance of theology as properly taught. And in terms of resistance, 
um, different cultures will receive these things in different ways. Look, I, I sat in the Holy Father's dining room with the bishops of Cambodia and Thailand, and I said, do you want women deacons? They said, we wouldn't care, male or female deacons. We don't have the educated people. We need, and this is where the, the installed lector and acolyte is so interesting and important for them and also for us uh, because you have to be installed as a lector or acolyte in order to be ordained as a deacon. Uh, and so what Francis is doing is incrementally, I think, moving toward, um, toward a future where he will be able to restore this tradition. Um, and I really say, keep, a, keep an eye on the Greeks, keep an eye on, on the Orthodox, because they don't have such a hang up about sex. They have married priests and they have a deeper uh, and better remembered understanding of the distinction between the diaconate and the priesthood and of the history of women in the diaconate. Uh, in terms of uh, uh, practice, uh, the synod is, it, sh it should be a synod on synodality, it should be a synod on clericalism, because really that's what he's trying to break, uh, to, to, as I said earlier, have, uh, have mostly secular clerics, but to, to act and react as adult human beings uh, with others. Uh, so I would, not, I would not want to leave you without hope, uh, because... Um, I'm not in charge, and neither are the uh, neither are the misogynistic clerics, even though they think they are. But rather to to affirm that it's God that's in charge, and and that we need to depend on the Holy Spirit in all of this. If if we're not, then we're just another political party, and you know we'll vote for whom we like. Uh, but I I I I. Uh, uh, I I I I don't like to be. Um, I don't I don't like to be so um, so hard on some of these guys who really think, you know, they 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 think they're doing what they were taught to do. And in fact, they are. Uh, and, and they just have to be reeducated. Um, yeah, so. I, mean, I mean, I I get that. I, I they're possibly in an echo chamber where they are. But the reality is that there's a huge exodus from the church. Over here in the UK, there are more and more small groups meeting together outside of the church. I know, church. and they are, they are in all over the place. Deb, yeah. do we have more questions? We do. Uh, okay. I'm well, here. I mean, I don't... Do you want to take them? Okay, so we've got two more. We've got, we've got Katerina and Robert, and then we have Peggy. Okay. So let's take those two. We'll go. Um, I think I'm picking up on things that you said before, like they they can't say no. They just don't want to say yes. Uh, it, it, because of recent things, I'm, I think a lot about unconscious bias. And it's hard, of course, to think consciously of that, which is unconscious. But uh, is it a, is that a category or a or a, a tool that you use in your thinking? And how do you bring it up and uh, how does it get addressed? You know. Um, sir, I, I tell you, it's funny. I was just reviewing conversation that I had, or they taped a conversation of me with uh, Bernard Poitier, who was also on the commission. We were in Ireland together. And then they had us in, in conversation. He is a psychologist. And he was answering your question um, about the problem of unconscious bias. And part of the problem is how does one bring it to, to consciousness? Um, and when I got that question, I said, you have to ask Father Poitier because he's a psychologist, but he's not here right now, so he can't help me. And I think that, uh, I think that what we, um, we, we need to address it and recognize it and be charitable, um, knowing that it is such a large part of some people's personalities um, that misogyny. I think misogyny is part of, of of personality in some cases. It 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 helps them understand the misogynist how to be masculine, and uh, uh, I I think I think marriage helps, but that's kind of a non-starter right now uh, for for ordained men. Um, 
So I, I think just talking about it and helping them understand, and and some of these guys do understand. You know, you you have a a priest who's who's stuck in a parish far away from other priests, and he needs society, and he he gets society with other men. Well, depending on the other men he chooses, it may increase his unconscious bias or it may decrease it. Um, and, uh, you know, but uh, I, I just don't know, sir. I, 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 it's, it's all, I, I had long conversations with the, the bishop who is now the, in charge of formation in, in the Diocese of Rome, who had been uh, a rector, a seminary rector for 20 years. And he asked the same question, you know, some of the men who are coming to seminary are coming with this unconscious bias. And uh, uh, I'm not a psychologist, certainly. And, uh, you know, you can only hope that with proper formation, which would include psychological evaluation, which would include proper spiritual direction, that they could outgrow it. You know, maybe we can think about it in that those terms uh, of out, outgrowing the need to be um, whatever the perception is of masculine, uh, I, I, maybe that would help. I, I, you know, that's that's the only thing I can think of. Uh, I hope that's helpful. Thank you for asking. I'll, I'll think more about it. Thank you very much. And the last question is from Peggy. Hey, Peggy. Uh, yeah. I, I even hate to bring this up because I've really enjoyed all that you've had to say. But bottom line, are we just trying to put new tires on an old broken vehicle? You know, well, you I know. see, well, I, I see it, it, we've been standing at the door knocking and we're not getting anywhere. We have intelligent, wonderful women who can really reestablish this. Do you think maybe if we got it, you know, working well, a good unit that they would want us to come and help? You know, they're looking at us almost as dummies. I hate it, that. I know. I know. There's. I'll show you a little book. Um, a friend of mine. It's a, it's a book for children called What's okay. a Decent? Okay, it's a picture book, okay. and yep. it's it's got it, you know pictures about what's a deacon, and Beth <laughs> dreams about being a deacon. And my friend who wrote this gave it to the pastor of her parish, who said, okay. "Why do you want to take our power away from us?" Okay, and, yeah, we're, and uh -huh. you know, so you know where that's going in exactly. terms of uh, anyway, uh, putting tires on old. You know, uh, had a comment somewhere I spoke recently that actually was in Ireland that uh, priests, uh, priests retire and, and play golf, whereas women religious and other lay ministers get retired. They just get a new car with more tires on them. Yes, so I, just I, I can't get out of it. And I think mm -hmm. that, I think that the, um, I think that, uh, <clears throat> I think the Holy Father understands. I really, really do. Okay. And I think yeah. he understands that it's crashing. Um, it's not crashing everywhere. There's 1.3 billion Catholics, but and and there are. I've met more bishops and cardinals in Rome. Perhaps again, um, perhaps he self-selects who stays in his house. I don't know. But I've, I've I spent. I think I said five months in, during the term of my uh, of my commission thing. Um, living in the house, and I met more bishops and cardinals who would support restoring the practice of women in the diaconate than who didn't. I only met two who did not, both retired men from Africa, um, but but to a man. Now, whether they're just saying that to my face and then, you know, stabbing me in the back, which, which is a, a great indoor sport in Rome anyway, um, you know, you don't know, but but uh, I don't want to give give up hope because uh, no, because no, it's, and it's it, not fun. No, no, I see that, but I, I worry too. You know, we talk about the seminarian; they're getting the old teaching, so things are not even at the ground level having a chance to uh, to change. Well, and you know, we look at ourselves as women and as laity uh, of women. We are educating ourselves. 
we have clerics that don't really know a great deal and we frighten them because we have a little bit more going here you know anyway yeah, well you know peggy look i've lived this all my life not only do i have five academic degrees and i'm also almost six feet tall i mean it's kind of difficult for some of these fellas to to okay. put up with me mm-hmm. And you just have to have to be charitable and understand that people people are different all over. And 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 you can't you can't be the the bull in the china shop. You can't be uh, lording it over them. And you simply Mm -hmm. have to say, you know, they have their. Foibles, they have their limitations and and accept them and hope that, uh, quite frankly, that they'll grow up. So. Yeah, well, hey. we still got some time left. So. Thanks, <laughs> Keep up your good work, and Thank we're you. following you. you we, we're supporting you all the way. Okay. Thank you. Thank okay. you. Okay. God Thank bless. You so much. This has been very rich. Thank you so much. I'm going to turn it over to Russ so he can take us out of here. So thanks so much again, Phyllis. Thank you, Phyllis, and uh, thank you to everyone for your very fine questions and the really wonderful um, back and forth that I was seeing in the chat room. So uh, this is a wonderful community we have here, and thank you for being a part of it.